stuff. Hi, I'm Jill, and um, I'm, even though my name tag says Kresh, I grabbed it without reading it. <laughs> we both have one that looks the same. Um, thank you for having us here. And um, I will say I have a practice this at home, and if it looks like I'm running late, will somebody in the room just like hold up ten fingers and say ten minutes to jail to wind down? Thank you. It's not my birthday today, it's past, so you don't have to sing happy birthday to me. Um, okay. Well, this was this fall that we spent a month. We were in the Republic of Georgia, then Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. And I still would have trouble finding them on the map, but they're close around the Caspian Sea and close to Pakistan in that area. And we went there. Um, I will say, Kresh, I just wanted to go someplace different. Kresh said, let's try the Silk Road, and I said, okay. It's that, as simple as that. So, um, you want to show the maps? Sure. Oh, yeah, you can do First, I want to say, Assalamu Alaikum. That is the greeting we had all over the stands. Not in Georgia, but in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And what it means is, Peace be unto you. And when we say that, the other folks will reply or echo, Walaikum salam, unto you peace be. And that's agreeing. Salam, shalom are the same derivatives. They came from the same source. Okay? Well, this is the Silk Road. As you can see, and the Silk Road started about 200 BCE in China when they were sending silk east, or west, let me try that again, west. But it developed so that it went all the way to the Mid East. You can look right here. Okay. Yeah. This area. It also went all the way down into India. And then it developed so that people from Europe and in that area came over to the, that part of the Mideast where they would meet. And um, I will say, if you heard of a cam caravan Sarai, this is a big area where they would house the people, the merchants and the camels. Some of these camel hordes, caravans, they call them caravan, it's a caravan of camels. Anyway, they'd be up to, you know, up to a thousand. I mean, they would just have, no, 100, talk, knock up, zero. But anyway, it's, it's a place where they could spend the night. Now, it would take the people from China approximately two years to get to this part of the world. It would also take the people from Europe approximately two years to get over. So when they got in those big places, that cities grew around them, Bukhara, Samarkand, Mary, etc., Tbilisi. And this is where they would trade goods with one another. Now, I do have a list of what would the, um, let's start with, this is what would come from China traveling west. Silk, tea, dyes, precious stones, china, and porcelain, I don't know the difference. Spices, bronze and gold artifacts, medicines, perfumes, ivory, rice, paper, gunpowder. That's coming. And some of the things that traveled from west to east were horses, including saddles and riding tack, grapes, grapevines, dogs and other animals, exotic and domestic, animal furs and skins, honey, fruits, glassware, woolen blankets, rugs and carpets, textiles, gold and silver, camels and slaves. Now, on this, which, this is Wikipedia, but they mentioned slaves coming from the west to the east. They didn't mention slaves coming from the east to the west. I do know that slaves have brought it from Africa to the Mideast. Next. Okay. So. Now you got Uzbekistan here and then Turkmenistan here. Okay, I'll take it with me, sorry. Okay, might be easier. And um, that's Turkmenistan, which you can also see there. 
And we were in um, Ashba, which is the capital, and went out a couple of times to different cities. We were only there about four days. Well, we started in um, Istanbul. Istanbul. Just happened to spend a day there before we headed out. Uh, this is George's most famous person who they kind of honored because he's famous and then have four for what he did. And we were supposed to, the idea was we would talk about religion over there and I am going to incorporate it. And this is George and they were having a, a Christian wedding. The Georgian Orthodox Church is the church of Georgia. But it, what was interesting to us is a couple, this is the bridal fan party, they would come in, have their ceremony, exit, the next group would come in. Like every 20, 30 minutes, another group would come in and they told us they have weddings any day of the year. There's, it's very popular to have weddings. There's the outside of the church. This is an old, old church, and it's typical of the architecture there. And the old murals. Not icons. And that tower, um, they had some kind of, they said that's where the bridal couple would spend their first night or something. I'm not, I knew, I couldn't look at the story straight, and I looked it up online and couldn't find anything about it. They did say, look at the shape, and that's the one that tells story, that's where the honeymoon is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just showing that Georgia is developing their ski industry, industry and that's one of the lodges we stayed at. This is the fruit that you would find, and of course pomegranates, <coughs> and juice. And um, go, ahead. go back one. Sure, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give it now. All three of these countries were former uh, Russian republics, and then in 1991 they all got freedom, and then they had to figure out who they were going to be. And um, now the Republic of Georgia, this is their flag. You notice there's a cross on it, and they're very much un legally. They do not have a state religion. They believe in separation of church and state. They believe that all religions are equal, except the, um, the Orthodox Church of Georgia is more equal than others. But in the process, there's no persecution. But when it comes to handling, the government handling people, the Orthodox are treated just a little bit better. And in all three countries, there are some Jews they are, in all three countries, they are emigrating out of the country. They're just, they're down to where, you know, another generation, should they won't have enough to have their, what do you call, the word when they get together and say prayers and need a minimum of people, it, it's, it's just deteriorating. And it's not by persecution, they're just getting out. And, um, okay. My Keep going. Oh, this is one of their favorite food they really like. It's a noodle with a beef filling and quite juicy, and it kind of slurps down. And of course, they treat it as to it. We went there saying, we like, through our travel agent, we found a group there that would take us around for those four days, and they said, what do you want? And we said, wine and food, and, and, and we got it. And that's a noodle, but I want to tell you, this is, I just wrote down one meal in Georgia, and this is one of the two main meals of the day, besides having this huge breakfast, okay? Cheese and breads, cold bacon, pickled flowers, corn on the cob, uh, eggplant balls, slow-cooked onions, tomato salad, hummus balls, bread, grilled kebabs, uh, grilled vegetables, and grapes. And when we were finished eating, you could feed it another four people. It was just, it, it really bothered us all to have all that food. I hope somebody else ate it. This is a spinach pie. This is a samosa. They call it samsa. Tomatoes, cucumber salad. I love that we had salads at every meal. We did go to, um, yeah, a 
that's okay, that one slide, no matter what we did, just disappeared. We did visit wineries, we did visit a place where we got to make the tandoor bread. Okay. Um, that's just a mural we liked. It was in a restaurant. Here we are with, um, we, this is at one of the wineries we were eating, and then we had these people go here. Can you get a lot? together for like a wedding, there's the Toastmaster and they drink toast after toast after toast and a glass of wine after wine after wine and they are a jolly happy party. And I went online and I found a list of 28 toasts that they could have, I'm not going to read all 28, but it's to the wedding feast, the bride and groom, to siblings of the bride and groom, to newborns, to life, to love, to the homeland, to our neighbors the guests to the Toastmaster, and lots of good wine. And we got to stomp grapes. First we picked them, then we stomped them. This is a Lucille Ball moment. Remember Lucille Ball? <laughs> yeah. And now we're getting into Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is known as the white, uh, Ashbad is the white city because the dictator, who was called Turkmenbashi, which means leader of the Turks, liked to build buildings out of marble. Carrera marble, not just marble. This is fine Italian marble. <coughs> and he's now dead. He has, he's now dead. Um, but he built 543 buildings out of Carrera marble. Quite a bit. Okay. <coughs> Can I move it away a little? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> All right. Now, I will talk a little bit about religion in the stands. We were asked to give a talk about religion and why they aren't killing one another. And I'm sorry, the answer is they don't kill one another because the dictatorships are so oppressive that they don't dare. Now, each of the countries in their. Can you get to away from here? Still too close? <coughs> How's this? You can't hear. Okay. Um, each country has, they recognize your right to have religion and your, your right to not have a religion. I like that. They um, believe in separation of church and state, but they are oppressive. They control religion, they control seminaries. Most of the people are Muslim. They control the education of the leaders, the imams. They go over the speeches before the imam talks. They have the right to go into any church building anytime they want. They can go into your home for any reason they want. And for the Christians, and you have to get permission to build a new building, and it's really, really difficult. Now, the Christians, most they don't want you to proselytize, so Jehovah's Witnesses are not welcome. They get extra harsh scrutiny because they like to go door to door proselytizing. They just don't want it there. The other group is the Seventh day Adventists, and the reason they have trouble is their religion says you do not you honor God and not the state, so they will not say the Pledge of Allegiance, and they will not serve in the military, which you know, the countries aren't very happy with that. But I found incidences. In Uzbekistan, where um, the majority are Sunni, like 90% Sunni Muslims, and yet one woman, they went into her house and like find her because she was having a religious study group in her home. They wanted in the church building so they can control you and see what you're doing. They also nobody, no woman was a, had to wear anything on her head in either country. In fact, I found an incident in Uzbekistan again where they kind of got after a woman. She was wearing the hijab. And they said, no, you can wear a scarf if you want, but, but you don't cover your whole body. We don't allow that in this country. 
So they, and, but the main thing they want, which is very, very important, they have legitimate concerns about extremist Muslims groups. And so they're trying to control them. And it, to you me, it may be kind of harsh, but this is a reality for them. Try that one? Yeah. Okay, I'll just try standing by this one. And like in these countries, you have to get permission for any religious material you're bringing in or that you're publishing in the country, and you can bring in a Quran or a Bible, and still there's times when they'll just confiscate it from you. So it is hard, and it's all because a dictatorship can't have any other groups plotting against them. Okay. So these are some of the 500 and 40-something white marble buildings. The interesting thing is they have more buildings than people. And you, we went around that city, and it, it, it was eerie because there's hardly any people. And that airport that we saw, it was designed to handle 17 million people a year, and it handles 2 million. This guy had a marble megalomaniac tendency. Yeah. This is a mosque that he built outside the city. It can hold 10,000 10, worshipers. So we asked the guide how many people show up, and he said, well, on a Friday, maybe 20. On, on really special days, maybe 100 or 200. Yeah. It's There's the inside. And you know, um, if you've been to Muslim countries on the arches and all these buildings, they will have engraved saints from the Quran. This one has sayings from the, the, the leader, the Turkmen Bashi, the dictator, which is interesting to a point where do you be, switch from dictator to God. Another monument. They claim that that dictator had over 900 statues of himself in the capital, gold statues. Asian games. Now, in one other thing he did, I mean, they got oil money. This is where this. And gas. So. Oil, I mean, gas, yeah, natural gas. So he built, they were going to have some Asian games that were going to last a week. He was hosting them. He spent billions of dollars to build this Olympic village, you know, it's Olympic like, to be used a week. Now it's vacant. Planted trees, though. And this, this is not a Christian statue. I was not able to find out what it was. What I did like is one good thing about this Turkmen Bashi is he was planting trees. You know, at one time in history, if you go far enough back, this place had trees, lots and lots of trees. They're all cut down for whatever reason. And he is bringing them <coughs> back with drip irrigation. So that's nice. Not all bad. The horse, the horse. I gotta find the name of this horse. It's, it's this kind you only find in Turkmenistan. It's called Akhal Teke, A K H A L T E K E. And they're very, very proud of these horses, and it is their national symbol. We have an eagle, they have a horse. <laughs> okay. Sophie. Now, Krish gets to read about this. He went to this site when I was going to the airport to collect my luggage, which was lost for 48 hours. Here you go. Uh, you probably heard about the Sufi and the Sufi tradition. It's a part of the Islamic uh, culture. Uh, Sufis are spiritualists, or the part of Islam that kind of uh, rebelled against the, uh, the external part or the commercialism of Islam and they focus more on the spirit or the internal part of their development. They were more into chanting and they're also into, um, s s you know, the twirling dervishes. You probably heard about Rumi. They are more into that kind of a thing. And they have a strong presence in both Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, this is a Sufi group and uh, what happened at this place is that there are Sufis who went around the, and they circled the, uh, the... Sufi shrine. There's somebody talking here. 
Yeah, it was a Sufi shrine, and they were circumambulating the Sufi shrine. Uh, and it was very much the young kids as well as their parents that were doing this traditional mar march around the shrine. Uh, uh, the Sufis are present in many parts of the, the world. India has Sufi tradition, Iran, and uh, also all, all the major Islamic countries have the Sufi tradition. Here are some of the Sufi women, and we had a chance to interact with them. The, notice the big part of the head dress there, that means they were married rather than a ring. So you can tell apart somebody who's married and somebody who's not. They welcomed us when we gathered to, you know, went to visit them, and they provided us with food as well. And you can see um, they're making food for us and themselves. Okay. This was a cultural event we went to. We had food and then they dressed us up, which is fun. And they had dancers and then they performed a wedding ceremony, picked a couple out of our group and a part of this is she has to untie a knot that he's wearing. It's just part of the culture. And one more thing, not, we're switching countries, but one more thing about Turkmenistan is that the government, this, is, this report is 2017, and they allowed 1,340 people to go on the Hajj, only that many. Um. The Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam, and um, uh, people from all over the uh, world who are of Muslim faith sometimes uh, would choose to go there, but there's a lottery system, so they don't all have to go there. However, there is another site in uh, Uzbekistan that will qualify as a Hajj. That's for the folks who don't meet the quota or cannot afford to go to the edge. Okay, and you can't quite read this because we've got students in Croatia in front of it, the, the sign, but this is Nukus, this is in Uzbekistan. First thing we noticed from traveling from Turkmenistan to Uzbekistan is there's people everywhere and talking to you and very friendly. And Nukus is on the map, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere part of in Uzbekistan or in the Soviet Union. But there was a, a Russian Savitsky. painter, Savitsky, yes. who got sent there for geological studies or whatever. And he made it his mission to save an art, up, especially new avant-garde art that was banned in Russia. They got it here, he saved it. He had thousands of pieces of art that were banned in Russia and he saved them. And after 1991, they built a museum, and you can go see some of this art. Unfortunately, we couldn't take pictures in the museum, but it was a wonderful place in the middle of actually nowhere. Yeah, it was an eight-hour bus ride to get anywhere to the next city. Kiva, Kiva. Now, this is Kiva. This is... If you're going to Uzbekistan, this is the oldest intact city. Ever, others are more modern. This is still the old one with the wall around it, the minaret. And this is just, if you know Gail Kearns, he's in the group and he's talking with some of the local people. Father, father. father. This was in three different cities we happened to hit when they were having a cultural festival. Pure luck. So this one people were dressed up that day for, and they had dancing and such. And one way to get people to have them, you know, allow you to take pictures, to kind of show them the picture, and after that you can have them, you can take a lot of pictures of them. And this one is a tradition that I have with Gail when I go around and we call it, you remember Hemingway had the old man and the C? This is the old man and the S-E-E. -E. Mm -hmm. 
Now, um, Uzbekistan is still quite Russian. They have two languages, Uzbek and Russian. And doesn't this look like pictures you used to see of the schoolgirls in Russia with the flowers in their hair? This was bargaining in the market. Um, those women are from Minnesota. It just so happened that we had two other couples from Minnesota in our group. Uh, culture. We went out and picked cotton. Um, quite a bit of, a, a little bit about the Aral Sea. Are you familiar with the Aral Sea? Now, the Russians, when they had this area in their, you know, in their control, decided that this was a fertile area for cotton. And they actually did irrigation. They took the rivers that were flowing into the aerial sea and moved the uh, dikes and canal system to grow cotton and dried up the aerial sea. It is a tragedy of huge proportion. <coughs> and uh, as we were driving through, I saw snow on the side of the road, but that was not snow, it was salt. And that is because of evaporation on, just under the dikes where the water was flowing, you can see the salt there. So they are really doing a terrible job of managing the water source in that region. Cotton is about 40%, in agriculture is about 40% of their the, the product in, in Uzbekistan. And it is a tragedy of a huge proportion. The Aral Sea also is so dry now that when the wind blows, the chemicals from there is affecting the lives of the people around there because they breathe that stuff. And I've read two things. One, the government is very much aware of what's happening. And number two, they're not doing anything about it. Ah, bread. Uzbekistan, for tourists, it's a heaven for eating bread. Here they're making kind of like naan, the big flat bread. And then they cook it in a tandoor. Do you know what a tandoor is? Like a huge, Clear. huge crock pot. Mm -hmm. And it's fired by burning the stalks of the cotton plants. Now this was one of the best breads I've had in my life, and I love bread. But it, it's made like a croissant, you know, layers and layers of rolled out dough with butter in between. Then you put it in a tundra oven, you take it out, and while it's almost burning your hands, you clap it, you break it into pieces and eat it. And I was in heaven. Closest to heaven I've been. <laughs> this was, we were making different noodles. They have a lot of noodles. Yeah, we're stuffing them with sometimes with squash, with onions, with potatoes, different shapes and different fillings. And some were fried, and some were boiled, and some were cooked in the tandoor. And the guys were outside, in separation of sex, but what the heck. They were looking at pomegranates and feeding the cattle, and cutting the hay to feed the cattle. Uh, the country is also known for its fruits and vegetables, and they have melons of many, many shapes and sizes. They also have apples, and the famous one is called the Greek apple, which is a different kind, but it's all over the country. Uh, they have dates and um, bananas, which are probably in the southern part of the, uh, the country. And, um, uh, and I mentioned grapes for wine as well. Now, and I'm going to take a break from the pictures to tell a little bit more about what's happening in Uzbekistan in case we run out of um, time. And after I read this, I will um, ask for questions. And incidentally, my source of authority is I went online and I just Googled religious tolerance in Uzbekistan, religious tolerance in Turkmenistan, and I got the U.S. State Department, which does studies and a report each year, because mostly it's about human rights. And each of these countries are considered a country of concern because of their lack of human rights. And um, a friend of mine who went to Uzbekistan also said she looked up in the Human Rights Commission, wherever that is, a worldwide human rights group, is also concerned about these countries. But, like I say, um, in Uzbekistan, 
And this was at the end, November of 2017. The dictator, whose name I could, Mirosyoyev, yeah, I'll skip that, but he decided to make some improvements. And, and most of this concerns the Sunni community. He cleared 16,000 persons from the security watch list. I'd say people were profiled. It was a list of potential religious extremists. Dispatched imams to prisons to begin a course of rehabilitation to the religious prisoners. Lifted some of the sanctions of day-to-day -day practice of Islam, allowing people to pray in public. They weren't allowed to do that before. Youth could not participate in the mosque before they were banned. He opened prayer rooms in the airport and he was going to be opening them in train stations. He allowed major mosques to use loudspeakers. We didn't hear him, but our friend did. You know, when you're in one of these countries, they call out. He had banned it for 10 years. Now they can do it again. He allowed fee-based courses in Arabic language and Quranic studies for the general populace. He established a couple of new seminaries. And now, this the Mufit, Mufitiate, trying to pronounce it. This is the organization, like the bureaucracy of all the different Islamic groups in Uzbekistan who decide what could be published, etc. except that they're under the control of the government. But they did allow some new courses to be put out. They raised the number of people who go on the Hajj from 5,000 to 7,000. Although this is interesting, you had to be at least 40 years old, you had to be checked out by the Sufi I mean, this organization, and by your neighbors. And your chances of getting picked, because more people applied than got picked, your chances were improved if you had connections or you paid bribes. <laughs> it's, it's the same everywhere. And they have come out with a Bible in the Uzbek language. They allowed publication of 3,000, even though they know that the public would love to have more. So that was the kind of reforms he's doing. Now, before we go further, are there any questions? Yes. How prevalent was English language? How prevalent? Wherever, as in most places I've been in the world where the tourists are, they learn English. In most kid, I mean, most countries teach English. So, of course, we had a guide. We went on an organized tour, and um, we got along fine because everybody, we, the sellers and all that, know English. Yes, there's another joke. Okay. How, how prevalent is Russian language? <laughs> I, it's quite prevalent in Uzbekistan. I mean, my ear can pick up the difference between an Islamic language and a Russian. So, yeah. the uh, the information we got from the guide, who was Russian nationality, uh, says that if you want to do the sciences and medicine, all the schools will get it through Russian, not Uzbek. So that was like a, the, the privileged language for the um, sciences. Yeah, I got, okay, I got the idea that Russian is more prevalent than Uzbek. I look at your picture, it seems like people are well dressed. Yeah, it could be. Buildings are pretty modern. Yeah. So I didn't see any sign of poverty. Am I concluding it inappropriately? Um, for one, I didn't look that up. Good question. The places that we went obviously were Western, you know, or, you know, first world it looked like in the cities and that. I don't know, but Chris, you got an idea? Both countries are floating in oil and gas. For example, in Turkmenistan, they don't pay, the homeowner doesn't pay for electricity, for air conditioning. They don't pay for gas as well for the car. They have stipends for food. So you, they have the resource and the resource is available to them. So we didn't see signs of poverty in there. And you're right, they're well-dressed and everybody goes to school, which is part of the Soviet, you know, the time is that there was universal education. There was universal health care, and people got educated in fact, 
one of the towns we visited, the guide pointing out, this is where when the Russians came in here, the women went and instead of burning their bras, they were burning their burkas and they were celebrated in that, in that town, in that area. So modern education and also multi-language, meaning they were studying not only Russian and Uzbek, but they are international. There are folks from Korea who are there now managing their gas and also planting rice with them. So they, there is a whole uh, slew of people from uh, different countries investing into these countries now. So they're benefiting from international community as well as from using their oil and gas resources. They're also chock full of mineral resources. They have uh, tungsten, they have molybdenum, they have uh, bauxite and so forth. And uh, all of these resources are, be, you know, and the Chinese are there. They've built roads into, and they, they are selling their gas to Iran and also to the Soviet Union and uh, the, so Russia and uh, as well as China. So they do have money. And we probably won't finish this. But I just remember where we saw cotton and the bread making, we got to visit a mayor there, and she was mayor of five, I would say, villages. And she said, um, what was interesting, her job was so, you know, she only had one helper and then one intern. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> More bread. And, but she was in charge, like, getting the government money to dis be disturbed, dis Distributed for roads, that was, and the regular budget and things we might think a mayor would do. But then also, when this is part of the system, when a local person graduates from college, she has to find them a job back there. And then she told us that she had just, like the night before, been up most of the night settling a domestic dispute. Here the police are called in, there the mayor is called in. So, quite an interesting job description. What we saw just now, this one here, we, we visited a... Uh, a synagogue. Yes? Um, subsistence income, I didn't hear about. I do know in Uzbekistan they do have government housing for low income people. Um, okay, what was the first question? Autonomous. Yeah. Yes, the yes, they are autonomous. Now, Georgia, in, incidentally, um, Georgia, the Republic of Georgia became part of Russia in 1885. So they were part of Russia a long time, and when they got independence in 1991, shortly after that, they said that some insurgents within the country wanted to go back to being Russian. I don't know if that's true or not, but Russia came in and took part of the country. And I got that feeling, there's a lot of Russians that went into all these countries, you know, because Russia sent people everywhere, and I think the two states that they took from Georgia were more Russian than Georgian. Okay. Well, that was a Friday mosque. Oh. Okay. Well, go ahead. Well, the interesting thing about the Friday mosque, some people go to a little local mosque every day, those who really want to, and then the Friday mosque is where bigger groups go. These are wooden pillars. And the interesting thing is, and then they're based in stone, but they said, how do you keep termites out of the wooden pillars? Even though it's a dry area, they have termites. So they put camel hair at the base, and that keeps the termites away, at least for five years. I don't know, because they told me if you see a, a nomad, a yurt made by nomads in Mongolia, they make them out of goat hair because it keeps the bugs away for like five years and then they have to make a new one. That's another question Yes, here. Um, I'm kind of interested in the ROC because I've been doing 
quite a bit of online mm. investigation. And it seems to me that it was a few years ago, it was an absolute environmental disaster because of the irrigation and also the health issues with the um, uh, <coughs> fertilizers and everything going into the air and people breathing things. Mm -hmm. um, did you get a chance to, to actually go there or hear anything to update it? Because I think they are really taking it seriously as they Turning, trying to turn it around. Yes, uh, there was a special museum that we went to and they showed pictures of the aerial sea at different stages and how it has been improved now because they're re-diverting water into it to make sure that. And um, uh, there are serious environmental problems, especially with chemicals mm -hmm. in the country and they have to work on that. They, are, they know that it's a problem but how do they solve it is another big issue. Yeah. Rish, uh, maybe you and me, I didn't see any pictures of modern commerce in terms of stores on uh, the modern highway. Did you not take the pictures? Uh, we, they, they were uh, major trunkways or highways but they were in poor condition in many of the places that we went to. But there, there are cities. Uh, and I'll, if you give me some China, I'll show some of these. But as for finding IKEA or any of those big stores, you know, I don't. We always went to the markets. I, I didn't notice if they had the big stores. Maybe, and we were only in the center cities, not the suburbs. Okay. Ah, does this look like good you know, roast steak? Something you'd like to eat? Well, next slide. Whoops, you missed one. Okay, that's all right. This one was well, okay. What? What? It, we missed a, a slide. Got deleted somewhere. It's horse meat. This is not Turkmenistan where they honor the horse. This is Uzbekistan where they eat the horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this. Okay, go ahead. What was the demeanor of the kids that you saw? School age kids. They were bubbly, happy, and playful. And the college age kids would stop you and talk with you and, and get a picture with you. They want selfies with us. <laughs> yeah, so this is rice pilaf in Uzbekistan. That wok held 50 pounds of rice. I'm not quite sure how many hundreds it feeds. And so they cook that and then they have onions and carrots and meat and quail eggs and they just put it all together and I had a half portion, and let me tell you, that was a big half portion. It was delicious, because they start cooking in the morning. You just slow cook it for hours. Yes? I assume atheism is banned um, You know, the, it never came up with our guides, but when I was looking up the state report, it said, each country recognizes your right to be an atheist or a free thinker. They actually had the term free thinker. And I didn't hear of any actions against people who were not religious. Uh, during the Soviet occupation of these areas, all the mosques and churches were turned into stables, shops, museums, and so forth. So religion was not practiced. So. I would imagine that there are a lot of folks here who went with no religion during the Soviet time. And now they, this is open and they're allowed. Many of these places turn back into religious institution. Except for the Islamic culture, they chose not to use these places were turned into stables, into mosque anymore because they were defiled. The rest of the group chose to use them again as either shops or churches or something like that. But um, I would imagine if you're an atheist there and you keep your atheism to yourself, you're okay. This is a sausage. Oh, there's the horse meat. <laughs> Uh, I like this because it was in those tuk tuks, those little buses you take around. This was an electric one, and we were going to Hammam to have a Turkish bath. This is local entertainment.
And we had several of these at different places where um, we saw local dances. We were, now we went with Overseas Adventure Travel, OAT. They specialize in having groups no bigger than 16, so several times we got meals in homes and they would have an entertainment there. So we got places you couldn't go if you're a group of 30. It's a breakfast table. That's one of the homes we were at. It's one of our very nice hotel rooms. We stayed in nice hotel rooms. And this was a part of Samarkand that had fallen into disrepair. And then after it became, well, the Soviets actually were repairing it during their time. And look what the new one is. It's the same place, but the Soviets restored this. And interesting, this area, the square had three madrasas. Now, we think of madrasas as places where you go to um, make terrorists out of youth. Madras was a university and they're very much, as you know, in the old days they were very much into the sciences and astronomy. It was a university, not just a place for religious education. It seems as if wherever there is poverty in the world, people cling more to religion. And it is also true in this part of the world, <coughs> these folks are mostly you know, out of poverty. So you can see they're not wearing the religion on their sleeves. That's the detail of a dome. There's another picture of the square. And another. And this is just somewhere along the road where we stopped and there was a well down there where they could stop and water their camels in the old days. Sarai. Yeah, Sarai. Another meal in a home. Uh, these students, they are sisters. They spoke many languages, including Russian, Chinese, and also Japanese. The students were university age, and they showed, took us to their room, and they showed us their, their books, their notebooks, their textbooks that they were using, and they have traveled. They've been out of the country. The old the sister there was in Britain, and Austria studied in Austria, and um, have relationship with people in China and as well as in Japan. And this is one of the homes, and they prepared the food for us. The mother was laid up with a broken leg, and then the girls took care of us. The, this is a show from Kyrgyzstan and we had a chance to um, uh, and you can see uh, this is a public square and um, men, women and they were doing traditional dances and some rock dances. And one of the persons in our group joined them uh, to do the, the dancing, uh, just mimicking or mirroring the others. We had a chance to do hiking as well. Uh, this is the Pamir Mountain close to the Afghanistan border. And that's it. No. Isn't it? Oh, oh, he added these. He added these when I wasn't looking. <laughs> this is a this is a urinal in one of the places we visited, and the photographs above that caused many of our tourists to miss. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Islamic country, and you would think they would be prudish. But no, there were more pictures there that I could not take because they were worse than these, <laughs> or better than these, I should say. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, if you just. Yeah, and I don't know, do you want to tell people they can go and the ones who want to answer could stay, or does everybody want to stay a while? Okay. Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, 
you know, for all their travel, we mostly were in our group and didn't talk with that many, but I never heard anybody saying bad things. And the guides are always very apolitical. So politics just doesn't come up. Uh, you can tell by their dresses. You can tell by their music. You can tell what they watch and know that they're very pro-Western. Because you can go into a store, you're going to hear Simon and Garfunkel. You would hear the Beatles. And that tells you that we have what we call cultural imperialism. Okay, there's, there's one more here and then we'll get over here. How would you describe their general appearance and physical uh, fitness? Everybody looked just fine, thank you, well fed and healthy. And it wasn't until at the last two cities in Uzbekistan where I noticed people had gotten so Western that they were putting on too much weight. Okay. I just wanted to know, what are the dates that you were on this trip? We got back just before, thanks, before Halloween, so it was most of the month of October. And that was in? This year. This oh, well, 18, yeah, 18. 18, okay. Yeah. Mm. Any more? I have one. Okay. Of all the places on the planet to spend the month in each of these unique area of the stands, what, uh, what, kind of, what kind of thoughts or information did you get to choose, to choose to go with? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm open to adventure. And it's a part of the world I hadn't seen. And Grace said, let's go to the Silk Road. And I said, OK. Is that easy? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Bill? Uh, what political differences did you see between the stands and Georgia? Uh, it seems yeah. like Georgia would be much more into the Soviet kind of living styles, whatever, as opposed to the, the, the stands. Quite the opposite. Georgia is more pro-Western than all the two stands that we visited. Very pro-Western. Did they still worship Stalin? Uh, no, no. They, in fact, they're embarrassed by that. But they say they have the museum there because they want to show it's an attraction. It's an economic benefit to the area. The t name of the city was Gori. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the guides that we have there, we, we, we questioned or we asked, um, how, is the, how do they feel about this person there? And she said to us that, hey, Stalin killed a lot of Georgians as well. So yeah, he was uh, an equal opportunity murderer. But if it brings tourists. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're going to. Any more questions, feel free to talk to them um, afterwards. So